Good. I'd like you to take the Word of God with me and open it to the book of Acts, chapter number 4. Acts chapter 4. Brother Smith, the song was so powerful, blew the sound system up. Appreciate it. Acts chapter number 4. I'd like to introduce you tonight to a friend. I've never met him, but I'm looking forward to meeting him. He is my friend because we have the same Savior, and we're going to spend eternity together in heaven. That's going to be exciting. You ever think about all the people you're going to meet when you get to heaven? This is one of them. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31, the Bible says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. There's a man given to us, seems almost a passing reference, doesn't it? In verse 36, a man by the name of Joseph, we know him as Barnabas, but that wasn't his given name at birth. This was the name that the apostles assigned to him. Could I ask you a question? If the Christians in this church had to assign you a name, what would it be? Not the name that you are known by now, but if the people that know you best were to describe your life, your testimony, your influence, your service, what would they call you? And the apostles chose the name Barnabas. Barnabas means son of consolation. Literally, they called him an encourager. They looked at this good man and they said, everywhere the man goes, he's building people up, he's exhorting people in the faith, this is the thing he is remembered for. This is what he was known for. He had the ministry of encouragement. I want to speak to you tonight on a ministry that every member of this church can have, and that is the ministry of encouragement. Some men, like our pastor, have a ministry as a pastor leading a flock. Some men are given the ministry of a deacon, and we have wonderful deacons in this church who stand alongside the pastor and help hold his arms up and I thank you as a member of this church I thank you for the faithful support you've given to the man of God through all these years some people have a ministry as a Sunday school teacher or they um, lead a Bible study during the week that's a wonderful ministry perhaps you're thinking well I'm not a speaker and I'm not a leader and I'm not an administrator and I'm not in charge of anything maybe you don't want to be the truth of the matter is, there is a ministry that as a Christian, not only can you have, you should have it. And that is the ministry that Barnabas had. Now, his name is mentioned 29 times in the New Testament. So this is not a fleeting reference to a man. Now, this is a man that made a deep, lasting impact with the one life that God gave him. He was not as famous as most. As a matter of fact, almost every time he's mentioned, he's mentioned with someone else. Mostly, it's the Apostle Paul. He was willing to be a second man. Uh, Barnabas was far from perfect. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul had to reprove him because he'd been carried away with some hypocrisy. We all get carried away at times, don't we? He wasn't a perfect man. He was not the best speaker. As a matter of fact, when they came to Lystra, Paul and Barnabas, Paul was the spokesman because he was a better speaker because Acts 14 says he was the chief speaker. Interestingly enough, in the entire New Testament, 29 references to Barnabas, there is not one recorded word that he said. Now, he did speak because the Bible said he exhorted people. But there is not one recorded word that he said, at least on earth, I believe there is in heaven, and God keeps better records than man does. 
but there is not one spirit-inspired utterance that he gave listed for us in Scripture, and I think the reason is that Barnabas' great ministry was not his speech and not his words and not his talk. It was his action. He was a man who exemplified what John wrote about in 1 John when he said, let us not love in word, but let us love in deed and in truth. This was a man that was so full of the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ, he could not help himself but try to show that love to other people by his actions. This is a man that was one thing. He was a helper. And I want to stop tonight and just say, Thank God for all the helpers. I look across this auditorium tonight and I see people who would be prominent in the pastor's eyes because they're hard workers, but as far as the congregation is concerned, many people wouldn't know you. They wouldn't know what you do behind the scenes, but I want you to know Jesus does. And sometimes a handful of people get an awful lot of recognition But in any church where the work of God is being done, there is always some brother like Barnabas who is humbly going about his duty, willing to be a help. I would suggest to you that God's children are most like their heavenly father when they're helping. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the Lord is our helper. What was the ministry of the Lord Jesus? Everywhere he went, he was helping somebody. I mean, look, he's homeless. He has no place to lay his head. And everywhere he went, he's trying to minister to the needs of somebody else. When you find somebody like that, you have found somebody that has captured the heart and the spirit of Jesus Christ. They don't have to be the big shot. They don't have to be the boss. They don't have to be the last one heard. They're willing just to be a servant and allow God to use them to encourage somebody else. Hold your place here for just a moment. I want you to turn over with me to something Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He gives a list here of spiritual gifts. And you know there's much that has been made of this list and other lists like it through the years. What is your spiritual gift? I think only the Holy Spirit can tell you that. But when you come to this list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a fascinating order given here in verse number 28. The Bible says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings. What's the next word, church? Helps. Governments. Diversities of tongues. I want you to circle in verse number 28 the word helps and notice, please, where it falls. It's sandwiched in between miracles, healings, and governments. And most people that I know, they'd rather have the ability to perform miracles than be a help. Or they'd rather be the one in government, in charge, making the decisions. But I want you to know that people who have the heart of Jesus Christ to serve and encourage others in the family of God are just as much filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit for their work as those apostles who perform the sign gifts and those people that God puts in administration in the local assembly. God himself appoints certain people with the ministry of encouragement. My family and I have had the joy and privilege of being in this church now for about 18 years. At least that's when I came. And through those years, I've watched so many people in this church Just help. Volunteers, giving sacrificially, doing something that no one noticed here late at night or sometime during the week when there was not a crowd to give any applause or recognition. And I want you to know, in my mind, this church will always stand out as long as I live as a church that is filled with people like Barnabas. My concern is this. Somewhere in the midst of all that helping, we forget that we're making a difference. And I want to say to you tonight, if you're encouraging somebody else, if you're ministering to somebody else, look please, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You may never see the results of it till you get to the judgment seat of Christ. You may never know what kind of difference you made in somebody's life, but 
I want you to know, for me personally, uh, there have been many, many a week where I walk down the aisle of this church and some, some saint of God just with a pat on the shoulder said, I'm praying for you. And that one comment was what I needed to get me over a hump. A text message, a, a note in the mail, a smile, a kind word, a brief prayer. You never know when God is using you to minister to somebody else. This is a ministry that God himself ordains in a local assembly, and without it, there is no way we can accomplish what God has given us to do as a church. It's interesting that Barnabas was not born with this. No, he was born as Joseph. But when he got born again, he got the Holy Spirit. And when he got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit started working in him and cultivating in him a ministry that he could use in the lives of other people. I think it's fascinating that he's not called consolation. He's called the son of consolation. When you think of a son, it makes you immediately think of who his father is. I would submit to you that when we call Barnabas the son of consolation, what we're saying is he sure is a lot like his heavenly father. He sure is a lot like his Lord. Can I tell you the greatest compliment anybody could ever say to you is that you remind them of Jesus? They see God in you. Not that you're famous, not that, not that you're in charge. They see God in you. Do you know the word consolation here is the same word that is used for the Holy Spirit in the Gospel according to John as the comforter. One called alongside to help. It takes spirit-filled people. To say, I'm willing to do what I can just to be a help. Now, I'm not going to show you all 29 references to Barnabas tonight. And I'm sure you're very grateful to God for that. But I would like to show you a handful of them because they reveal to us something about the ministry of encouragement. It was Prime Minister Gladstone in England years ago that said, One example is worth more than a thousand arguments. And I can give you a lot of arguments tonight of how people are having a hard time and everybody needs encouragement and this is something we all could do. But rather, I'd like to just show you my friend here. His name is Barnabas, and I want you to see how God used his life. I'm going to ask you to do something tonight with a pen in hand. Sometime while I show you these things, I'm going to ask you to write down the name of at least one person. You say, who is it? I have no idea. The Holy Spirit will tell you. I'm going to ask you right now to ask the Lord to show you one person that this week you could encourage in the Lord. I don't know who it will be, when it will be, where it will be, but somewhere this week there's somebody that needs the encouragement you alone can give if you're willing to be a minister of encouragement. Let's begin in our text. Look at verse number 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpretation, the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Watch verse 37. Having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Would you write this down somewhere? Number one, he encouraged the needy. He wasn't giving to show off. He wasn't, he wasn't giving because he had some duty. No, he was a cheerful giver. And what was he giving to? He was giving to the local church. But why was he giving to the local church? Back up, if you will, to verse 35. The Bible says, When these gifts came, they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had, and I want you to underline this word, need. Could I say to you, there is always need. There is always somebody in need. There is always somebody struggling. There is always somebody having a hard time. How many of you have ever had a hard time? Would you raise your hand? Sure, it may not even be financial. It may be in some other way. But there's always somebody in need. I, I, right now, while I'm speaking, I'm seeing the faces of people. This past week, God put on my heart, I need to sit down and write a note to the lady that led me to Jesus. I haven't seen her in years. I hear she's in ill health. I need to write her a note and just tell her, God used you in my life. Whose face is in your mind right now? I'm thinking points of need that God let somebody's life intersect with mine and God use them in my life. Wait a minute, who's thinking of you that way right now? You see, when this man gave his substance, it was just evidence that he'd already given himself. There was nothing held back. There was nothing off limits. There was, there was nothing too great to ask for someone who was a member of the body of Jesus Christ and doing everything he could just to encourage those who had need. Notice this in verse 37, he sold something took sacrifice. He didn't fuss about it. He didn't grumble about it. He sold the land. He took the money, brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Look, please. He was submissive to the authority that God had put in that local church, and he believed he was a part of something greater than himself. 
Can I tell you the joy of being a church member? We're studying it every Sunday morning in our Sunday school right now. One of the joys of being a church member is being a part of something so much greater than yourself. And I wonder, I wonder who in this church is in need and God could use you to minister to them. I wonder who on your job this week or who that lives next door to you in your subdivision or, or who that you'll cross paths with this week, somebody you haven't seen in a long time, and God's going to say, that's the person. That's the person of great need that I want you to seek to encourage. It's interesting, in the next chapter, we have a married couple that steps on the scene. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. Perhaps you've heard of them. They went through the motions that Barnabas went through, but their heart wasn't right. They had a piece of property. They sold it. They brought half the money and gave it like it was all the money and lied to the Holy Ghost and lied to the church and pretended to be encouragers, and God smote them dead for it. I want you to know there's an awful lot of Christians pretending to be good Christians, pretending to be encouragers, but God himself knows our heart whether we're doing it for the right motive or not. And Barnabas wasn't doing it to be seen of men. Barnabas did it for Jesus. He ministered to the needy. Let me show you another one. Go to Acts chapter 9 with me. In Acts chapter number 9, Saul gets saved. That's the apostle Paul. Oh, what a glorious conversion. Come to think of it, every conversion is a glorious conversion. But what a conversion for the Christian church in Acts chapter number 9. And the Bible says in verse number 23, And after many days were filled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known as Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, and they were so excited to receive him. They were just glad he got saved. Is that what your Bible says? No. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I want you to, let's put that where we live for a moment. It's easy to criticize these people. I want you to get in your mind somebody, and please don't say out loud who it is, that you think is one of the greatest enemies of the Christian faith alive on planet earth today. Now I want to ask you two questions. Number one, have you prayed at all that God would save them? Because we do an awful lot of fussing about people, but we spend very little time praying that those same people would come to Christ. Question number two, if they did come to Jesus and walked into this church tonight, would somebody say, we're so glad to see you? Or would some cynic say, well, I wonder what they're up to now? Because that's exactly what they did to Saul when he walked through the door. He's got something up his sleeve. He's the greatest enemy the New Testament church has ever known. I'm sure he's here to find out who's on the church row and arrest every one of us. Can I tell you, this is a, a crucial crossroads in the history of the church. And one man, look please, one man made a difference. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. How many of you are glad for the ministry of the apostle Paul? Boy, I am. Think about all the New Testament scriptures and all the wonderful things God revealed through him to us. When you get to heaven, let me tell you somebody you need to thank. Brother Barnabas. Could I say something to you? You never know who you're helping. You never know who you're helping. When a Sunday school teacher took an interest in me, he had no idea what I would do with my life. But he helped me. When a businessman took an interest in a little boy and led him to Jesus, a shoe salesman, he had no idea that young man would shake two continents with a gospel. You have no idea who you're encouraging. Encourage somebody in need, but number two, encourage a new Christian. I looked at these precious people that came to Jesus this morning and this, this young lady that came to the Lord, and she may, may be in the meeting tonight, but I, I watched her. She responded to the gospel invitation. From the back, she left her place and by herself walked the aisle and came forward and came to Christ. And we all rejoice and we say, praise the Lord, and we come by and we shake her hand. But I wonder, is there anybody in this church that would say, 
That's my assignment. That's my ministry. That's the one. Maybe I can't do everything, but I can do something. I, I can't minister to everybody, but I could minister to somebody, and that's the one I'm going to encourage. See, that's what a church full of people like Barnabas would do. They'd be looking for ways to bring them into the fellowship and not just bring them into the fellowship to help them establish a testimony. Let's just be honest. Saul needed a little help at this juncture. He's not the great apostle yet. And every Saul needs a Barnabas. I've circled two phrases in my Bible in verse 27. I circled the phrase, Barnabas took him, and then Barnabas brought him. Barnabas took him, that means he accepted him right where he was. Barnabas brought him, that means he brought him where he needed to be. And you know what people need? They need somebody to love them right where they are. Not to fuss at them, not to tell them where they don't measure up, just to love them in Jesus' name right where they are and patiently work with them to bring them along. Look, my whole life is a bunch of people who have taken an interest in me. And that's your story. If it wasn't for somebody that helped you and encouraged you, you wouldn't be in this church building tonight. You wouldn't be raising your kids for God tonight if somebody hadn't encouraged you. I mean, met people who encouraged my dad and encouraged my mother and help them. I want to go back to them and say thank you for helping my parents when they were a young married couple learn the Bible and love Jesus and teach them to teach their kids the Word of God because I've been the beneficiary of that. Now, who am I going to do that for? The ministry of encouragement ministers to needy people. The ministry of encouragement ministers to new Christians. Let me show you another one. Flip over to Acts chapter 11. Here he is again. He just keeps popping up, doesn't he? The ministry of encouragement encourages the entire church. Revival's broken out in Antioch, and the Bible says in verse 22, Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas. That is, you go as far as Antioch. In other words, when they needed a guy to encourage a church, they knew exactly who to send. Wouldn't you like to be that person? Somebody says, I know he'll be a blessing. I know, I know she'll encourage him. I know they'll say the right thing. Look at verse number 23, who when he came, and had seen the grace of God, was glad. May I pause for a moment? Can I tell you the ministry of encouraging other people is a joyful ministry? It's a glad work. It's frustrating, and, and you, you get disappointed with people, and you can get disillusioned at times, but it is joyful to see God at work in people's lives and know you're in on that. He was glad, and here's the word, exhorted. Same word, consolation, comfort. He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. In other words, it wasn't enough they'd gotten saved. He said, I want to help you know the Lord better. I want to help you press on in your faith. I want to help you become everything God saved you to be. That is the ministry of encouragement. You know how strong this church is? It's as strong as the people that are part of it who are exhorting one another. The pastor doesn't do all the exhorting. He can't do all the exhorting. Those of us who get to fill the pulpit when he's gone, and we're grateful for the privilege, we, we don't do all the exhorting. No, no, no. Every believer has this ministry of encouragement. Hold your place here. Go to Hebrews 10 with me just for a moment. And notice what God says to the church in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, verse 25, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Consider one another, love one another, exhort one another. That, that is the ministry of encouragement. And that's what Barnabas did. Look back in Acts 11 with me for just a moment. There's a little description of him in verse 24 that I think is one of the most wonderful verses in the whole Bible. You want to meet Barnabas? Let me introduce you to my friend. Let me brag on him for a minute. He wouldn't brag on himself, but the Holy Ghost did, so it's okay for me to do it. Look at verse 24. The Bible says he was a good man. I like that word, don't you? And immediately somebody wants to say, I thought the Bible said there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And there's nothing good in us. Well, that's the key. In my flesh there is no good thing. But in the Holy Spirit there's lots of good things. 
When the Bible says he was a good man, it didn't just mean he was a good moral fella. It meant he knew God and he was full of God. God was all over this man. Matter of fact, the next phrase clarifies that. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. What was the result of that? Look at the last phrase of verse 24. And much people was added unto the Lord. Did you know one person can make that kind of difference in a church? One person. One good man full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith can lead a whole parade of people behind him into the family of God and into the work of the Lord. You know why? Because when you live the way Barnabas did, you make Jesus and the Christian faith very attractive to a lost world that's searching. A little girl prayed one night, Dear God, please make all the bad people good and all the good people nice. I like that. There's a lot of good people, frankly, that aren't nice. They're saved, they love the Lord, they believe the right thing, but they're not nice. How many of you know a good person that's not nice? Don't point, just raise your hand. You know, we should pray, Lord, help me to be such a witness of your beauty and your love and your joy that when people see me, they think of you. Could I ask you something? Who could you encourage in this church? Could you write a letter this week? Do you know anybody that's been missing? Could you take 30 minutes and just swing by and say, I just want you to know I've been missing you? Could you make a phone call tonight? Could you find a younger couple in the church and say, as an older couple, we're going to help this young couple try to teach them some things others have taught us? Could you find one of these teenagers and say, I'm going to try to help that young man. His mom and dad are trying hard and trying to do all they can. I'm going to come alongside him and try to help him, encourage him, press on with the Lord. It's a thousand and one ways to be an encouragement. Look, please, it's not that we don't know how. It's that it's not in our hearts like it ought to be. And Barnabas got it in his heart. Flip the page, if you will. Let me show you one more. He encouraged the man of God. He'd been doing it from the beginning with Saul, but now look at him in Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul. Would you underline that? Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And when they start out, it's Barnabas and Saul, but about two pages later, it's not Barnabas and Saul anymore, it's Paul and Barnabas. There's a subtle but definite shift in the leadership of this missionary team. Paul rises to the top and becomes the man who leads the way. I love this. There was not a hint of jealousy in Barnabas. There's not a word in Scripture about him being upset that Paul took the more prominent role. Instead, he becomes his faithful missionary companion right by his side. Look, please, when they stoned him, Barnabas was there. When they were chasing him out of town, Barnabas was running with him. Paul writes about him in 1 Corinthians and says, Me and Barnabas, we're both having to work while we're preaching, but we're both working. Barnabas was there. You know what's significant about that? As far as we can tell, Barnabas was a fairly wealthy man who walked away from all of that to encourage the man of God. As a matter of fact, go back to chapter 11 for just a moment when things were really going good. I mean, they were really going good in Antioch. Notice what he does in verse number 25. After the Bible says he was a good man, he was full of the Holy Ghost, he was full of faith, much people added to the Lord. Look at verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him into Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You want to be a Christian? You want to be like Jesus? Then live like Barnabas did because that's where it happened. Barnabas, look, he is the big fish in little pond. He's the main man in Antioch. And instead of boasting in it and basking in it, you know what he does? He thinks about Saul who got sent back to Tarsus and he says, you know, he would sure like this. 
And not only that, I think he could be a real help here. He's got some gifts I don't have. So he leaves where he is and goes and finds the man of God and brings him back to Antioch with him and lifts him up and encourages him and pushes him forward in the ministry. I'm going to tell you, God will bless somebody with that kind of spirit. By the way, that's why 2,000 years later we're talking about him tonight. Dead to self and alive to Christ and hungry just to make a difference in the world, he had the ministry of encouragement. We have a wonderful pastor. There is a man of God that leads this church. He is not a hireling and he does not have a job. He loves the flock. I've listened to him weep and pray. You that have been here a long time have watched him labor in the word to help us and try to form Christ in us. Can I tell you something? If we're the Christians we ought to be, we're going to make one of our primary ministries the ministry of encouraging him. Pray for the pastor and his family every day. They need it. Write a note of encouragement. Say a kind word after he preaches the word of God. Do something nice. Be a blessing. Stand with him. Don't grumble and complain. Be a supportive person. You say, well, what's that all about? Look, please, that, my friends, is the ministry of encouragement to the man of God. And God will bless you and bless your family for it. R.G. Lee said, Barnabas played second fiddle, but he played it so well that the kingdom of God made progress. He rode second in the gospel chariot, but he did it with such humility and joy and gratitude that heaven will forever rejoice. In other words, we're talking about him and God recognizes him 29 times in the New Testament because this is the man that ministered to the man of God. I'll give you one more and I'm done. Would you turn over please to Acts chapter 15. And interestingly enough, there's a disagreement between Barnabas and Paul in this chapter. It's a meaningful one, and it has tremendous implications. Somebody said, Barnabas being a troublemaker? No, actually, he's doing the same thing he's always done. He's encouraging. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And somebody says, well, that doesn't sound very nice. Barnabas disagrees with the apostle Paul and goes the other direction. Well, here's the setting. The young man Barnabas wanted to take was a boy by the name of John Mark. John Mark had been with them on the early missionary journey and had done pretty well. He was a fine young man with a lot of potential. And somewhere in the middle of that trip, he got discouraged. He packed his duffel bag and went back home. Paul had been frustrated with him, exasperated with him, and Barnabas said, let's give him a second chance. And Paul said, no, I don't think so. And Barnabas said, I see something in that boy. Let's give him a second chance. And Paul said, not on my missionary team. And Barnabas said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, I, I feel like I'm supposed to do it. Matter of fact, the word here in verse 37 is Barnabas determined. He was determined to do this. Barnabas said, I'll take John Mark and, and you take Silas over there and we'll go different directions and may God's blessing be on us both. Now, this is really interesting. You see, we have the privilege of looking back and seeing the full story now. Somebody says, well, who was right in that argument? Barnabas. And how know? Because when Paul wrote his last letter to Timothy, he said to him, would you bring John Mark with you? Because, get this, he is profitable to me for the ministry. By the way, the gospel of Mark, that's him. Look, you want God to use your life? And find somebody that's down. Find somebody that has failed and encourage them. This is Galatians 6.1, in action, brethren, ye which are spiritual, if a man be overtaken of all, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here's a man that found those who failed. 
By the way, aren't you glad we have a God of second chances? And third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh, oh, the mercy of God. I've been the recipient of all of that. Somebody that catches God's heart about that becomes a merciful person and seeks to restore those who have failed. This is the ministry of encouragement. A little footnote. Barnabas was related to John Mark. Best we can tell, it was his sister's son, his sister's boy. Could I just say this? If you're going to start the ministry of encouragement, start with your own family. Encourage your husband. Encourage your wife. Encourage your children. Let's start at home. Let's work in our church family to encourage one another. Let's work on the job this week and at school to encourage other people. Look, everywhere we go, let's pray for divine appointments. Oh, God, give me somebody I can help along the way, somebody I can encourage in Jesus' name and have a part in the wonderful work of God. John Bunyan told the story of Christian on his way to the celestial city. And early in his story, you find Christian in the slough of despond. <laughs> he's in a pit. He's in a big hole. He's mired up in it. He's got a companion with him, but the companion's not much help. He leaves him, says, I'm not sticking around here. He takes off and goes home. His name is Pliable. And Christian is left all alone by himself in the slough of despond with a burden on his back, and a man comes. And John Bunyan aptly names him Help. It's the only time you find him in the story of Pilgrim's Progress. We know nothing else about him, but we know one thing. He got down where that pit was. He reached out a hand, and he helped Christian up and set him on his way. And I came tonight to tell you, there's an awful lot of Christians in this world who have a heavy load. Some of them, everybody else has forsaken them, and they're mired up in it. They don't know if they're ever going to get out. They don't think they're ever going to make any progress on their pilgrimage, and they need somebody just to help. From time to time in this church, we have somebody come and say, they're answering God's call to be a preacher. They're answering God's call to be a missionary. That's wonderful. Well, I came tonight to see how many Christians would answer God's call to the ministry of encouragement. So you don't have to move anywhere to do that. You don't have to give up your job. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything really except just be filled with the Holy Spirit and ask God to use you this week to be sensitive to the needs of people around you. I want to ask you this question, and I'm done. How many of you have thought of at least one name or one face in the last 30 minutes? Would you raise your hand, please? I'm going to ask you somewhere right now to write their name down if you haven't done so already. Would you just write their name down? Because that, my friends, is our assignment for this week. May it always be said that the Temple Baptist Church was filled with good, spirit-filled, faithful people who were engaged in the ministry of encouragement.